Hello and welcome to the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, episode 85, You, Me, and Monopoly. From Hamilton, I'm Sean, and here with me, live and direct from Windsor, Ontario, the Tabletop Bellhop himself, Moti. I am the Tabletop Bellhop, your cardboard concierge, your RPG maitre d', answering your game and game night questions and striving to make everyone's gaming experience better. Let me put my years of game playing, event hosting, and game, uh, event organizing, and game night hosting to use for you. I'd like to welcome everyone here in the lobby on Twitch. We start live every Wednesday night at 9 p.m. at twitch.tv slash tabletopbellhop. All right, we got a somewhat packed show today. Nothing I think will be overly long, but a lot of little segments we want to put in. So first off, we are answering a very important question about Monopoly. Then we're going to open up the floor to our guests in the lobby, our live chat room here on Twitch, and host a live AMA answering their questions right here on Twitch. After that, uh, once we're done answering your questions, I've got a re-review of a classic dice-driven bag builder that is Courier's. And finally, it's going to be a really short weekend review at the end of the show. We love interacting with our listeners and viewers. Each week, we're going to highlight some of our interactions with you fine folk. We'll share some feedback we've received, comments on our content, and maybe some gaming discussions we've been part of through the week. We want to share what people are saying, whether that's positive or negative. We get better with your comments and suggestions, and if you'd like to let us know something about the show, you can send your feedback to mo at tabletopbellhop.com and or sean at tabletopbellhop.com. That's S-E-A-N. You can also hit us up on social media. I can be found everywhere as tabletopbellhop, one word. And I can be found everywhere as Dark Elf. LX. Well, first up this week, a comment from Roger Malosh in regards to our house rules episode. I really enjoy Chicago Express, but found the scarcity of funds and the initial bidding at the beginning of the game to be very unforgiving. Once a player gains an edge, it's very hard to overtake them. In order to alleviate this, I introduced loan markers. A player can take out a $25 loan, big red poker chip, at any time. Whenever dividends are distributed, about every five or six turns, they must pay them back along with a $5 interest charge, or just pay the $5 to hold on to the marker. The player's total money is reduced by $30 per marker if they did still hold any at the end of the game. This didn't make the game any less forgiving, but it did add an interesting new dynamic to the game, as well as a good lesson in debt management. Mm. I enjoy the game even more now. Well, thanks for the comment, Roger. Uh, I do own Chicago Express. It's a solid one. Uh, a light 18xx game from Queen Games. One that can be played in like 45 minutes. Very neat game. But I have to admit, I haven't played it enough times or enough times in a row, like in a short time period to notice a runaway leader problem. Not that I'm saying it's not there. It does sound like you have a solid solution, though. This is definitely wouldn't be uh, the first rail game with a loan mechanic tossed onto it. Actually, it's a pretty common mechanic in other ones. And I think they pulled it out of Chicago Express probably just to keep it simple. But it sounds like it's working for you. So great job. Well, Chris Groff had a comment about our games to play when stuck at home episode from a couple of weeks ago. Have you played Aeon's Legacy or even just non-Legacy? We're currently playing through Pandemic Season 2 with friends, ironically put on hold for a real pandemic, but the discussion is for another Legacy game after that. Mm -hmm. The kicker is it has to be co-op. I know Season 3 is in the works, but personally, I don't know if I want to play more Pandemic right away. I was looking for options. Oh, thanks, Chris. Um, I have played Aeon's End, but just the base game. I haven't tried the Legacy version. I do like Aeon's End in general. The original game's really solid. Uh, it's a very cool take on deck building that does a couple unique things. For one, it's cooperative, which there aren't a lot of out there. Uh, there's the DC deck, or the Marvel deck building is one of the few I can think of in the Aliens Leg Legendary series, but not many others. So it's it's rare to find a cooperative deck builder. But the really neat part, which I'm sure everyone knows that they've heard of Aeon's End or heard us talk about it on the show, is that it's a deck building game where you never shuffle your deck. So a lot of the game is on stacking your deck properly and trying to get the timing right so that things happen at the right time. And once you throw in the co-op aspect, then it's not even worrying about your own timing. It's also timing what you're trying to do with everyone else, which is a really, like, really forces that player cooperation aspect. I have heard nothing but good things about the Legacy version, to be honest. Like, if I was going to go out and buy a new version of uh, Aeon's End tomorrow, I would probably aim for the Legacy version myself. So I think that would be a solid recommendation. Oh, we got a couple of comments on our three-player games where one of the players is a toddler host that was recently reshared. First up, 
Alex Hakobian writes, this list is incredibly relevant to me and my family. Thanks for putting it together, Mo. Well, you're welcome, Alex. I'm glad it was useful for you. And Martin Voss writes, a recent favorite here is the kid's version of Ticket to Ride. It's very playable for my five-year-old, and yet I'm not really missing all that much compared to the full game. Many toddler games are pretty lame from an adult perspective, which isn't a problem because you're still having fun with your toddler. But if there's an actual real game in there, it's a nice bonus. Yeah, definitely. Thank you for the comment, Martin. I, I've never played Ticket to Ride Junior at all, or First Journeys. I think they're called Ticket to Ride First Journeys, the kids' ones. Uh, it's not a game. I actually don't think it existed when my kids were young enough to play that one. because It's fairly new to the market, but I bet you it's a solid game. What I did do, though, was with my girls, and just recently, like since we've been off work and everything, or everyone's been staying home, is I broke out Ticket to Ride New York. Now, this is a shorter four-player max 10, 15 minute version of Ticket to Ride. And I think this might be a great next step for you as your little ones get a little older. All right, well, next to comment on our War of the Rings unboxing on YouTube. Sild Seffing writes, so much plasticky goodness, my number <laughs> two favorite game of all. Oh, thanks for the comment, Sild. I am really looking forward to getting this one to the table since doing the unboxing and reading the rules. Now that Deanna is starting to feel a bit better, I'm hoping it's going to be sooner rather than later when I get this one dusted off. Well, next in comments on our quick and easy two-player game recommendations from a few weeks back. Brock Wagner writes, No Jaipur? Also, have you tried Watergate? It's excellent, quick and easy to learn, but gets devious once you're familiar <laughs> with it. Oh, thanks for the comment, Brock. I have not tried Watergate. Now, from what I know of it, I'm not sure if it would count as quick or easy. I don't think it's one of those games that can be played in under half an hour, but I might be wrong. I thought it was a little bit more of an involved pain. But I have heard really good things about it. But I don't know. For me, Watergate, I just, I don't care. Like, I I don't, yeah, I kind of know what happened. It just, I maybe it's because I'm Canadian. It just doesn't matter to me, so it doesn't appeal as a, a game topic. But I know Brock is also from Canada. He's from the Great White North, so obviously some Canadians are into it. Just wasn't it wasn't a game I I'm like, eh, Watergate, not nah, don't really care. Now, Jaipur, that's one of the games you've been playing on Board Game Arena regularly, right? The one with the camels? Yeah, I had been for quite a while, but we actually played it so much that I think we both kind of uh, okay. pushed it off because we were playing, I mean, four and five games a day sort of thing. Wow. It was just whenever we were both online at on BJ at the same time, we just cycle through games, uh, you know, back to back. So, uh, yeah, no, it's a fun game. Um, I don't know if uh, it's certainly quick. Uh, it's almost yeah. too quick to be to be worth setting up. It was nice, nice to play it on the on the uh, digital version. All right. So maybe something we'll throw it in the show notes as a recommendation. I don't know if it deserves to be on our blog post or not, then if it might be just a little. I don't know. It depends. Some people do deserve, want people, those really quick do games. seem to really enjoy it. So, yeah. It's one I should at least try playing it online. You can show me how to play. You teach me instead for a change. All right. Well, Cardinal Tales on Twitter had this to say about quick and easy two-player games. Great article. I'd put Samurai Spirit on that list, if for no other reason than it is less punishing ghost stories. Two-player is just like the solo game, which is also very good. All of the talents available to you. The other five are used only once per game, but oftentimes that is enough. It plays like the higher player counts, except the family symbol is way more important. Great little card game. Well, thanks, Cardinal. I, this is interesting to me. I don't know. I, I own Samurai Spirit. It's a fantastic cooperative game. And the whole thing, though, is it's uh, you're playing the Seven Samurai. It's, it's a, a recreation of that. You're trying to prepare your village from raiders who are coming in, and you're playing seven different characters. And I find it's an awesome seven-player game. Right, this is one I'll break out, break out instead of Seven Wonders because I, it's I, the theme's cooler. It, I, I find the game more enjoyable. Plus, it's co-op, which is often better when you got a large group of people all playing together, which I dig. But I would have never even thought to try this with two players. Like to be honest, when I first heard this, I had to go on Board Game Geek to even see if that's recommended. And actually, it is one to seven. So it just I just never thought. I'm like Seven Samurai game with two people just seems weird to me. Again, I'll be sure to toss this in the show notes. Maybe in the next coming weeks with, with Deanna home, maybe we'll play this. But I, am, you know how much how she thinks about co-op games. So probably be a while before I ever try this one two-player. But to me, great seven-player game. And hey, if Cardinal says it's good, we're trying with two. All right, well, that's it for this week's comments. Thank you to everyone who shares, comments, and interacts with our content. 
We start Wednesday nights at 9 p.m. Eastern here on Twitch. We love people who drop in and take part in our chat room in the lobby. If you're here live, remember to stick around as we continue the show after the double bell with more chat and some content that otherwise only our patrons get. All right, what do we got in the chat room so far? So I did see one thing. Ryan pointed out a couple of co-ops that I forgot about. Shadowrun, Crossfire, Dragonfire. When he mentioned that, I remembered the old Warhammer adventure card game. Warhammer Quest adventure card game. Then there's a Pathfinder adventure card game. So, okay, scratch what I said earlier. It's not really all that unique for being a co-op deck builder. Now, the shuffling thing is still unique, but I guess there's there's way more co-op deck builders out there than I was thinking at first. I can still think of a ton of cooperative or competitive ones, but yeah, there's more out there than I was thinking. For some reason, when I was first when I first read the the comment, I was like, oh, the only thing I can think of, like technically, Marvel Legendary isn't a co-op. Everyone plays it that way, but the rules, it's not a co-op game. DC's competitive, and I was kind of I'm like, oh, the Aliens one, yeah, that's cooperative. So I'm thinking they're rare, but yeah, there's definitely those those other ones. That uh, Harry Potter, yeah, there's another one. I said there's an awful lot actually. <laughs> It is, he, he is looking for legacy, though, so that's... Uh, well, yeah, legacy co-op. Co yeah, well, there are other legacy co-ops. Uh, I didn't have this in the notes, but um, there is also Charterstone. No, Charterstone's competitive. Is there another? Clank is competitive. Clank Legacy. Yeah, I don't know if there is another co-op legacy game besides Betrayal House at the Hill. I don't... Is that cooperative, partly? I know every time you have the haunt, right, and someone becomes a bad guy, but is it cooperative otherwise? Gloomhaven. Well, Gloomhaven. yes. Yeah, there you go. Yes. Well, or there Frost, you go. Frosthaven's on Kickstarter Frosthaven. right now. Yep. Yeah, uh, Gloomhaven. I don't. Gloomhaven's not a deck builder though. No, it's not. But it is. It is a cooperative legacy game. I. I guess it's a deck builder. You build your deck before you start, but you can't modify your cards while you're playing. It's a deck builder. It's a deck construction like Magic: The Gathering. Yeah. Going back to our mechanics episode. Yeah, I think I don't think they they like deck builders, but really, realistically, it sounds like they just want. A co-op legacy. The co-op so, legacy. Yeah. Gloomhaven and Frosthaven work. Yeah, I, I highly doubt Chris is going to dive into that one, but we'll <laughs> see. I was looking forward to seeing Chris. He was going to be a breakout this year. Chris and Rob, they're good people. We met a couple of, years ago. I was looking forward to seeing a lot of people at uh, yeah, breakout. Yeah. I was looking forward to getting a haircut that I didn't give myself before breakout, but that doesn't I didn't look too either. terrible. Yeah, no, I, I kind of. Hey, Zanister. Hey, Zanister. All right, so tonight I am going to be talking about the best damn versions of Monopoly out there. And I want to know, as usual, if we do a game recommendation episode, same thing I always ask. If I missed your favorite, please let us know. If you are obsessed with Poodleopoly and there's actually, that's a hidden gem, I want to know it so I can put it on my list. Now, this is going to be a pretty quick segment. We're going to fire through this one quickly because we got to make up for last month where we totally forgot to do an AMA. So we're going to do a really quick rapid fire Ask the Bellhop, and we will be right back to the lobby. We're here to answer your game, gaming, and game night questions. You can send your questions to questions at tabletopbellhop.com or head over to tabletopbellhop.com and click on Ask the Bellhop. Uh, social media works too. We're everywhere as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. Now, the best way is for questions come through the website. I am not going to say no to a question asked anywhere. So far, nobody has asked, what's the best version of Monopoly out there? All right, first off, before, you, before I tell you about the five best versions of Monopoly, I want to note something. Uh, this goes back to our topic three weeks ago now, I might be off on this, where we talked about house rules. Because Monopoly is by far the most house-ruled game of all time. Now, I'm not going to get into why at this point, but I will note these house rules that people don't necessarily realize are house rules are things like putting money on free parking, allowing players to build houses and hotels on one property instead of having to spread them out evenly over all your properties, rewarding you for landing on go, or completely avoiding the whole auction phase, right? You knew there was an auction phase in Monopoly? Well, many people don't didn't even know or didn't learn until much later in life that there were that they were house rules. The game is simply mistaught most people. Now, what I want everyone to do before you decide you don't like a game or you don't enjoy a game, not just Monopoly, any game, make sure you're playing by the proper rules. After your first play of a game that doesn't go well, take the time to review the rule book, check for an FAQ, check online for an errata, and make sure you're playing the game the way it was designed to be played. Some games just might not be for you. 
and that's fine. Sure. But make sure you're judging the game and not how someone other than the designer thought it should be played. Exactly. Now, with that PSA out of the way, let's move on to some great Monopoly games. So number one, this is the best Monopoly game in the world. This is Monopoly Deal. This is a two to five player quick playing card game that plays in about 15 minutes. It's a set collection game where players are trying to be the first to collect three full property sets of different colors. It features multi-use cards that can be used to either take actions or as money. Each turn, players draw two cards, then play up to three cards. Cards can be played as property, as money, or as an action, depending on which card it is. Actions let you do very Monopoly-like things like collect rent, receive money, and acquire properties from other players. And that was Monopoly Deal. The second best Monopoly game in the world is Monopoly Gamer. Now, don't just think that Monopoly Gamer is Monopoly with a Nintendo theme on it, with Nintendo game properties and Mario and that. No, this is actually... Um, more character-driven. You're actually going to pick a popular Nintendo character to play. Base game comes with four, but you can actually buy expansion packs for more. And then each of these characters has two special abilities, giving the game an asymmetric element, something everyone that listens to the show should know I enjoy. Now, the goal of Monopoly Gamer isn't to be the last person with money. Instead, it's to earn the most points. And you get points by collecting coins and buying properties with those coins and winning boss fights. Each turn, you roll a movement die and a power-up die, and then you decide what do you want to use first, your power-up or the movement, which adds a lot of strategy to each game, or tactics, sorry, tactics to each game. Many of the power-ups cause your opponents to drop their coins on the board so someone else can pick them up. So you might want to hit Mario, who's ahead of you, with a Koopa shell so you can move up and grab his coins after he drops them. Now, bosses come up every time you pass go. To fight a boss, you need to spend coins to enter the fight, and then you roll a die to see if you beat a number on the card. If you beat it, you get a reward, which is worth so many points. If you lose, then the next player can fight the boss if they want. Keep going around the table until the boss is beat or everyone's had a chance to fight it. Now, the game ends when you get to the final boss, which is, of course, Bowser. And once Bowser is defeated, the game ends. Now, no, that means there is no player elimination in this version of Monopoly. And that was Monopoly Gamer. All right, I'm kind of cheating by putting this as number three because it's a very similar game. This is Monopoly Gamer Mario Kart. This is basically monopular, Monopoly Gamer. Almost everything is identical in this game as the other, but it's not just a retheme. Some rule changes are in there from Monopoly Gamer. Now, the biggest change in Monopoly Gamer Mario Kart is the boss fights are taken out and replaced by races. Races where players in first, second, and third place get rewards. Players must pay a buy-in pay in coins to race, Races are really simple. Everyone just rolls a D6. Whoever gets highest gets first. Whoever gets second highest gets second and third, and so on. And um, you get points. Whoever wins the race gets the card and the points. Everyone else is going to get coins. Other changes include the ability to drop bananas, which stop players in their spot, just like in the video game, and boost pad spaces that race you around the board that make the game a little quicker than normal Monopoly and Monopoly Gamer. And similar to the original game, it comes with four characters. You can buy additional booster packs with additional characters. And that is Monopoly Gamer Mario Kart. Next, Monopoly the Mega Edition. Now, I got to say, when I see the Mega Edition, I think, oh, my God, it's Monopoly, but like twice as long with twice as much stuff going on. Interestingly enough, it's the exact opposite of that. This is a version of Monopoly that you can play at max an hour and a half. It's actually a quicker version. Now, this plays two to eight players, so it also plays additional players. It features a larger board with some new features. So there's train depots, skyscrapers, nine new properties, and the $1,000 bill. One of the biggest things to speed up the game is in addition to rolling your two dice to move, you also roll a speed die. If the right symbol is rolled, it lets you instantly move to the next unowned property on the board. That is the big fist. Like, I, as soon as I heard this, I'm like, take that die and put it in your normal game of Monopoly 2. And they accept then your house ruling. So <laughs> and we're ignoring our own PSA. Now, later in the game, once everything is bought, it just jumps you to the next property you owe rent on. The game also includes bus cards that you get from the community chest that will allow you to move anywhere on the board when spent. Now, another significant change is that some of the property sets have gone up to four properties, but you only have to own three to be able to build. Now, the other addition is when you're building, in addition to building hotels, you can then upgrade one hotel to a skyscraper, which is, of course, worth the most rent in the game. Well, and that is Monopoly the Mega Edition. 
And finally, the last of the top five Monopoly games is Monopoly Express. This is a roll and write version of Monopoly. Roll and writes are super hot right now. This has been out for a long time, though. This is not a brand new shiny roll and write. Players are trying to collect sets of properties, which are valued and color coded based on the original game. You're going to, this plays two to four players, about 20 minutes. You want to be the first player to reach a set number of points. The number of points is determined by the number of people playing. Each turn, you're going to roll 10 dice. Dice that show policemen, like the go-to-jail symbol, are set aside. Players select a number of dice to keep in your tableau, and they can keep re-rolling. And then you can re-roll any number of times, but any time you get three policemen, your turn is over and you make no points. Either So it's it's got to push your luck element there. Now, the dice you kept are get to put on a player board and score points. And again, this is based on basic Monopoly, so you need whatever, two purples to complete that set and three yellows and so on. It's the same, same ratio that you would find in the board game. If you complete a set, you score points for all your complete sets. But if you don't manage to complete a set, then you just add up the values on the dice because each of the dice has a numbers, on, numbers on them. There are also rules for houses and hotels, and then there's a special pass-go symbol that lets you get 200 bucks and keep rolling and so on. A little bit more details to this game. Now, it is worth noting that Monopoly Express is actually an updated version of an older dice game called Don't Go to Jail. That version has slightly different rules. For example, instead of the policeman, you had dice that said go to jail, and you had to roll all three words to stop rolling. And there were no rules for houses and hotels in that original version. This does rate better. Everyone who's reviewed this says that the Express version is better. Well, and that was Monopoly Express. All right, I want to finish off by saying, yes, of course, this was meant to be a bit tug-in-cheek. Uh, we are recording this episode on April 1st right now. Despite the fact that, yes, this is a bit of an April Fool's joke, I did actually do some research for this article. The five games I talked about tonight are literally the highest-ranked Monopoly games on BoardGameGeek, the number one site for board game information on the Internet, for anyone who doesn't know it. Uh, while the topic may have been a bit of a joke, I do stand by these actual game recommendations. All of these games promise to be significantly better than the original Monopoly and decent games that stand on their own. Now, what's interesting about this, and Mo had no idea, is that I actually just bought Classic Monopoly at the demand <laughs> of my wife and kids wow. as an Easter gift. Now, I tried to convince them otherwise, letting them <laughs> keep assuring them that there really are better versions of Monopoly out there, but wow. I failed, so it seems I will get a chance to see wow. what Monopoly is like with kids uh, and I will not be allowing house rules in my plays to start. No. I like Monopoly Gamer. Your kids are into games. Like, uh, it just makes perfect sense. I, I like Monopoly Gamer. It sounds like a, <laughs> a good game. Like yeah. not, not, uh, not a horrible game is probably well, to be fair. Generous. Even classic Monopoly is going to be better than the kids version of Monopoly yes. that someone got my daughter at some point where there are like birthday parties and things instead of properties and there's no building and it's, it's awful. I mean, it's candy land, wow. the monopoly. It's, it really is. Uh, <laughs> well, that's it for our thoughts on the main topic tonight. Be sure to head over to the blog at tabletopbellhop.com where you can find this and other gaming advice articles by clipping, clicking on gaming advice. All right. Well, now that we're done with our thoughts on the main topic, we're going to pop into the lobby and back into the uh, Ask Me Anything, where we're going to talk about uh, the AMA. All right. So first, though, any comments on the top five Monopoly game list? I think I see a couple I might have missed there, at least one. Uh, so interestingly, the one thing we talked about a couple of weeks ago was the uh, electronic version. Now, I went looking for it, and there's an older electronic version where they just replace the, the money with debit cards and visa cards or whatever yeah, yeah. uh and apparently it, it was supposed to play a bit quicker but the reviews sounded like the, it didn't really make much difference the cards were really low quality and would break down quickly but the version i found when i was looking online actually was different it used more like a sort of a qr code on the back of cards that, that you tapped and actually talked about the prices the market prices fluctuating uh, yeah, that sounds cool. Now, interestingly, I didn't find it listed under Monopoly on the Hasbro website, so it may be uh, out of print right now. But uh, that one actually looked interesting because I think market fluctuations are a really interesting aspect and a nice way to replace the auction, which a lot of people just don't want to deal don't with. Don't use anyway. Yeah. yeah. 
So I see Ryan recommended Monopoly Tropical Tycoon DVD version. That is one. The only reason I know about this game is Tom Vassell has raved about that, of it being his favorite version of Monopoly. I have heard that is really good. Um, it introduces a rule that every version of Monopoly should use. The game ends when one player is eliminated. The player with the most money wins. I have heard of that house rule. We should have included that because that's a solid house rule for yeah. making Monopoly end. Um, I personally think grab that die from the Mega Monopoly and use that exact same rule, that if you roll the thing, you just skip to the next unknown property, yep. which I think is a great way to just keep the game progressing without... I don't. I can't see how that would break the game in any way. Yeah, no, it makes sense. Another one that is supposedly fantastic and is it is rated by, again, this is the Dice Tower, and I can't remember if it was Tom or someone else, as both the best and the worst Monopoly game on the market is um, Hotels, Monopoly Hotels. Now, this doesn't look anything like Monopolies. It's got like three plastic towers and you're sliding in floors. And But again, Tom said this is a great game. Like it's like Monopoly deal. Anytime I go online and I post something to do with Monopoly, I'll get three or four people bashing it like, yeah, yeah Monopoly's terrible. But then I'll have someone go, but have you played Monopoly deal? Everyone says Monopoly deal is fantastic. Like I strongly stand by the, that recommendation, though I have to admit I haven't played the game myself. This is how Tom talks about this Monopoly Hotels. But the reason it's the worst Monopoly is it is the dumbest box I have ever seen for a board game where it like it's all spiky and there's a round curvy bit like it looks mm. like a convention center in 3D. Like mm. there is no way you're putting this on any shelf anyone owns. Right. It looks great on a merchandising shelf yes. in a toy store. But when you actually think about the storage potential, oh, someone it's... failed their role. <laughs> Yeah, it, it is absolutely terrible. It is it is like one of the worst game boxes. Like, I'm not a fan of tins because they don't look good on my shelf. Like, this thing is, like, spiky and a big round part. Oh, it's, it is horrible. Right. All right, on to the AMA. Uh, so far, I haven't seen any questions for us except for a couple little things up. Uh, Deanna has suggested that we probably should have done the absolute worst versions of Monopoly because it's April Fool's. You know what? There's a couple things. For one... Um, People may actually ask this question. So I wanted to have, I when I came up with the idea that, oh, you know what, I'll review Monopoly. And I'm like, eh, just reviewing Monopoly's name. Wait, I'll do the best Monopoly or the worst Monopoly. And I'm like, you know what, the best Monopolies is something someone will Google. Someone will Google what's the best version of Monopoly, and it would be awesome if my website came up. Yep. So for, that's one reason I want to take it serious. The other is right now, I don't know, read the room, right? Is, is this really the April Fool's? You want to be making lots of stupid April Fool's jokes. And I'm like, yeah, I'll do an April Fool's thing, but you know what? I'm going to take it seriously. I'm, I'm going to put actual information out there. These are Monopoly games that I would be more than willing to try. Any of these games, if someone can bring them out to a Windsor game night once we're allowed to go to those again, I will happily try all of them. And I'll do up a full review and then tell you if I was right that they belong in this list. Uh, and we actually, you know what? I, I We probably would have put something, possibly even put Ms. Monopoly in there. And yet one of our patrons has uh, recently been enjoying it with his daughter. So, you know what? Yeah. There's something for everybody. Yeah, I, that one, I don't know. What, when <laughs> I saw, what at least what I saw of Ms. Monopoly did not seem good. Like, the, the, the Monopoly from Millennials looked absolutely horrible. The Monopoly socialism looked even worse. But yeah, I'm sure we could have done the worst. I, I didn't even bother looking on Board Game Geek, because there's probably just a whole bunch that were just rated one. Yeah, there's actually uh, there's Monopoly Cheaters Edition is in print right now. It's See, that's supposed to be pretty good. It's actually rated 4.8 on uh, Board Game yeah, Geek. That, that's above four. That's that's better than some. Yeah, I think the, the one I, one of them was like five. But yeah, it's like fake a die roll, steal some bills for the bank, skip out on rent. Yeah, uh, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. And then there's handcuffs. Yeah. Doesn't sound like a board game night to me. It sounds like a different kind of night. Uh, there's a there's a pizza monopoly right now too that's on the Hasbro website. Uh, that's like in a pizza there box. Are, there are so many. Like there's every city in the world has yeah. a, an monopoly. There's every breed of dog because a bunch were on sale at one point, like Dash Houndopoly and all this. And it's just the same game with the rethemed, renamed, um, renamed properties. Right. Yeah. That's all you have to do is rename the properties and you got a new version of Monopoly. So, and actually, I'm looking at this Monopoly pizza game right now, and it looks a lot like the uh, kids' version that I got from, uh, yeah, it's... I don't know, Deanna's saying the pizza one may be discontinued because she's been seeing it in clearance. Oh, it's still on Hasbro's website. That's why that's yeah. the only reason I know about it. Yeah, Warhammer 40k Monopoly exists. Well, I'm not sure. Which, which that I'm one, sure. when it came out, I was like, wow. In the deep, dark future, there is only rent? Like, <laughs> I don't know. 
Unless there's a way to attack other players, that's not a 40k game. There's I no was chaos. really disappointed. If there's no chaos. Like, there's no point. <laughs> yeah, I got the the Star Trek or Star Wars. Sorry, Star Wars. When Episode One came out, they released this Monopoly version with this 3D board and metal miniatures and all this stuff. And I really thought it was going to have some actual Star Wars element. And there was like, if I remember, instead of chance cards, there was like light, light or dark side cards, and you could pick between them. But like that was it. Like there, right. there, it was. 99.9 straight up monopoly and and the one little stupid rule to make it better whereas like the jedi's path version of life whenever the path branches you choose light and dark side and if you fall to the dark side by the end of the game even if you got to the end first with the most money you lost because you had the most dark side i'm like there you go like it's the game of life it's still everything that the game of life is but at least there's a star wars element there's a push your luck element of course the dark side pass give you more money and make it quicker but if you overdo it, you lose at the end of the game. And I'm like, see, that's cool. It's Game of Life with a cool Star Wars theme. The, this one was not. Well, I mean, I suppose like Star Trek shouldn't even be able to have a Monopoly version technically because uh, they're post, you know, it, it, it's post scarcity, right? Everyone has <laughs> oh, yes. they need, unless you're doing the Picard version uh, where apparently they've gone back to having scarcity in their... Uh, I don't know. They say that about Star Trek, but Deep Space Nine was all about the Latinum. There's all kinds of financial transactions. Yeah, but that going was outside the Frankie. that was outside the Federation, right? That oh, was they're like, in the Federation. They're on the border. Yeah, that's the thing. They were on the border, so the the the, yeah, I guess. the other races had scarcity, but you know. Uh, uh, my, Ryan's point out the ring moving around the board in Lord of the Rings Monopoly is an interesting way because it ends when it gets to the end. That makes sense. That is one. That that's one that like there were others that were on this list. Like I did the top five. But as I kept going down, like the next one was a Pokemon Johto edition. If I had done the top six, but I know nothing about that. I would have had to read up. I had to be honest. I had to read up on most of these right. to know to, like I had an idea what you do in Monopoly deal, but I had no idea what made Monopoly Gamer different. I, I watched lots of Hasbro videos today. Mm -hmm. to, like I said, I did real research on this. There you go. All right, come on, people. It's supposed to be an AMA. Give us All questions. Right. We're still well, we talking about Monopoly because no one's asked us anything else. <laughs> We got, we got a question uh, stacked up here. So Danielle has asked us, board games where the goal wasn't to win. Basically, is there a no-win condition where you just decide that you are done? Or what is a board game with an end state that is not a victory for any player or the group as a whole? So alternate victory conditions. All right, this is one that I am hoping the chat can help me with. So I toss this one in here because Danielle asked. I was hoping Danielle would be in here tonight. Must be busy tonight. I do see maybe see if she in the is. chat room. All right, maybe she came up with some more. So this was a conversation we had on Twitter that I thought it would be in, worth talking about because I'm hoping maybe Sean can think of some too. I had a whole, I had a really hard time. Like the, the whole thing is a board game. The definition of game, there is a win condition. That's what makes it a game, right? That's That's part of, so like almost every board game I play has a win condition so there were a few i thought of so one example is um tales of the arabian nights now this is a house rule though technically you set a threshold at the beginning of the game and i can't remember what the two are but there's two pillars of things and i don't remember they're diametrically opposed pillars and you set like you have 20 points and you can set one to eight and one to 12 and as soon as one of those hits the top you win like the game ends but the game is really a which way adventure where you're moving around a map. It's a whole Sinbad Arabian Nights thing where you're running into the Jinn and you're getting cursed and you're going on pirate raids and all this neat stuff. And it's you see a beggar. How do you approach them? And you can say, I approach cautiously. And then you look up that on a grid and it tells the player next to you to read a passage out of the book. And it's like, oh, the, the whatever, the, the beggar is actually a prince in disguise. And because you approached him cautiously, he sends you on a quest to go do a thing. And then you go do the thing and you collect a counter and one of those two things goes up. And like, you can play this game until you're bored. Like, and that's how most people play it is, you know what? We're going to sit down at 6 p.m. and we're going to play till midnight and we're going to tell an awesome story. And that's what the game's all about. It's all about the experience and the story you tell because you can't game this. You can't game the system. Like, yes, when he tells you to go get the thing, you could go a different direction. But really, like, it's not, it's not high strategy. It's not high tactics. It's all about the experience. So that's one of them. Um, the other thing we came up with is party games. In general, most party games have a scoring system, and most of them we throw them out. Like, I think our group is one of the only groups I've ever met in the entire world that actually managed to go through the scoring round and tell illustrations. And I don't know why we even do it, but there's a whole thing where you go through and everyone votes on which of the ones was the best guess, and then someone gets a point for the best pitcher. And someone... Every time we played, we've done it with points. But I know most people out in the world just play telestrations until you're sticking to playing telestrations, or until everyone's had a chance to be the start player. 
and then you end. You're just done. The the goal was to play the game. The, it was the the adventure of it. Um, similarly, we do that with uh, concept. Whenever I we play concept, like the rule book says, throw out the the rules. They're terrible. Actually, I think it says if you feel you the need to use scoring, here's a system, but it's terrible. So we just play until we're bored. What we play is whoever guesses the answer is the next clue giver, and we swap spots at the table and. Then in the next person answers the question becomes the clue giver. And then eventually you're like, well, you know, we've been playing for five hours. I've had enough. Uh, I see people talking. Uh, now there's some, some huge threads on this and I just, I just found a rabbit hole on board game. Geek. Okay. Um, so board game geek defines games as something that has a, a, a an end condition. condition. Yeah. Um, exactly. and, and so the majority of definitions of, of, of official definitions of games have a quantifiable end point. Now, yeah. the argument is, is a quantifiable endpoint the same as winners and losers? Can you have a quantifiable endpoint yeah. that doesn't have winners and losers? Uh, for instance, Hanabi doesn't have winners or losers. It just ranks all the players. So yeah, technically, one of them is the highest ranked, but I guess. not necessarily the winner. I, I um, would say in Hanabi, if you get whatever the 24 points you won, yeah. you, uh, you beat Hanabi. Absolutely. Uh, another another uh, example is Duck Duck Goose. Duck Duck Goose okay. is a game that has an end when you're done. There is no winner or loser in Duck Duck Goose. You just keep playing. Does that? Ha I wonder if it originally had one, like uh, once one player has three points or something. <laughs> but you know, but that that like that that's a that's a game. Now some people might call that an activity. It's sort of in the but that's, well, that's in the same it. way. Like you call you don't consider um, uh, some games games <laughs> yes. uh, so uh, you know <laughs> well, that's just it. some games are activities activities yeah, yeah. count like the other one i was thinking of is is um like role-playing games obviously right yep. role-playing games there, there's no winner so like you might finish the adventure you might have a goal to get up to level 20 but like in specific he was looking for board games yeah uh so there's my the, the overlap games right so for the queen for the queen does have an end the the i don't know i don't even think it's a spoiler because i think it tells you what happens but the end of it is the queen is attacked. Do you defend her? There is no wrong or right answer to that, and the group doesn't win or lose. You just finish the experience. I can't think of a lot of other versions, though. Um, there are other, like, ten candles. I don't know if that's considered an RPG or a uh, board game, but again, it's you light ten candles while you're playing. It's a horror game, and once the tenth candle goes out, the game's over. Yeah. Uh, another one uh, people talk about is uh, Bananagrams. Uh, yes, technically there are rules for winners and losers, but I was say, a lot of people a lot of people don't really seem to agree that those should exist. So um, okay. uh, it, it's a better game without them, basically. Interesting. Um, no. So uh, I, what else? I don't know, like anything. I'm trying to think of stuff. Like I know, like I played Talisman Experience where we set up our own ending, where we're like we must have hit all the adventure cards, but like it's all house rules, right? Yeah. I can't think of many games I bought where. There's, I just keep thinking there's got to be more, which is one of the reasons I wanted to discuss it tonight. Uh, once upon a time, the storytelling card game, again, yeah. it has scoring and a winner defined, but most people agree that you have to rule it without yes. it, and it's better. <laughs> yeah, any of those two, uh, Rory Story Cubes yep. is another one, right? You roll the cubes, you tell the story. Um, that, that definitely would apply. Um, there's that Icarus from Renegade Games. I haven't played that, though. It'd be nice if, if um, Jeff was in the chat room tonight, because I know Jeff's played it. That one sounded interesting, where you're like you're doing a whole fall of an empire. I'm sure there's more. I just, I just, there are not a lot, that's for sure. There's definitely not a lot of, like I said, the no, definition no, of a game. Most yeah. people's definition of a game is, is either there's a win condition or an end condition. That's what makes it a game and not an activity. Why is the game we complain that is it's an activity and not a game? I know people say the game, Candy Lane. but the game you can win. Like Candy Lane, the, the, Candy Lane is the is the number one. <laughs> yeah, but that yeah, that's just because it's predetermined. There's yeah. there's no actual player choice once the deck's been shuffled. Well, sorry, you have a choice, but there's always an optimal choice. And if everyone just did the optimal choice, the winner is determined by the shuffle of the deck, not anything the players do. Right. That's completely different. That's deterministic, which is why it's uh, not a game to me because the players have no actual. They have so, the illusion of, uh, of choice. So interestingly, I've actually got up right now the board game geek game criteria. So this is what determines whether or not you're allowed to be called a game on board game geek. Okay. Uh, and uh, if a solo if a solo game player must make decisions to work towards victory, 
Uh, but again, it's victory. Uh, and or games generally need a point where someone or a group of persons has won or someone or a group of persons has lost, including cooperative games where the game wins. wins or loses. Uh, so they that basically eliminates drinking games, sex games, parlor games, yeah, pass, there you go. The, entertainment the, and passing time games are eliminated by that definition. See, I hadn't thought of those. There's all those those interesting dice games. Yeah. Our two player date night article has a few of those linked at the very bottom of it. So yeah, there's there's those games. We've had a couple of those. Yep. Uh, all right. What else do we have? Okay, so uh, next up, we've got a question from uh, Roger Malosh uh, joining us. And uh, thank you for the follow uh, on Twitch there, hey. Roger. So board game, in the arena, chat. board game Arena is currently overrun, and I can't even log in yeah. most of the time. Now, I want to say one thing. If you pay, if you become a premium member, you can always log in. As a premium member, I get notices, and I get some slowdowns. Uh, they actually had a serious failure of their server host last weekend uh, that they actually went down, like the site went down uh, out of their control. But as a premium member, you get in first. So mm -hmm. uh, even when you can't get in as, as a free member, I'm able to get in and play as a premium member. But that being said, we don't all have money right now. Times are tough because we don't all have jobs anymore. Yeah. And, you know, the question is, what do you think of Tabletopia or the Steam board game simulator? All right, so one thing before you go to that board, it's cheap, isn't it? Board game arena, like three dollars Canadian or something a month or something like that, or three uh, fifty, maybe four, maybe most, four. Yeah, it's like under five dollars a month. So if you just want to be able to get in, uh, a problem. I the problem is I can't answer this yet. So we've been asked. This is the most popular question we have gotten or yeah. seen on the internet, not necessarily even directed at us. Recently. Is how can I play games online? And my initial thought was everyone else has covered this. Like literally every gaming blog out there seems to have covered it. But obviously not everyone's read those yet. So this may be our topic for next week. The problem is Sean and I need to try more of them. Yep. Um, one of the things I don't like is one of the ones, which I think is Tabletop Simulator on Steam, when it was released, was a platform. It was basically a 3D tool manipulation platform. It's a physics that, simulator. It's a yeah. So it like all the table was there and all the pieces were there, but it was as if the game was in front of you and you'd have to move the pieces. And part of that is developing the skill to do that in this VR and not like knock things over. Yeah. And if you watch the Steam preview for it, ninety percent of the videos are people flipping tables because that's one of the things you can do. No one seems to show off the game. Now I thought that's how it still was, and I have since heard from multiple people that people have now made mods where the game does stuff for you. It'll move things for you. It'll track things. It'll keep track of your score. It'll do all the things that like Board Game Arena does. Now, I haven't seen it. I tried a beta way back when it, all it was was a simulator. Like, like that was it. It was this, to me, I, I would never yeah. do it unless I, I was forced to because it was the, like trying to manipulate the things was more work than it would yeah. be to play the game. It wouldn't be fun. And also, it's not cheap. I mean, you've got to buy the no. tabletop simulator and then you also, in some cases, not all, but in some cases, have to buy the game content yes. as well. Uh, and then again, in some cases, the game isn't doing anything for you. You're still just doing there. all the math. It's just giving you the ability to play that game. Uh, yeah. And I should also, we should also point out, uh, as Ryan has mentioned in the chat room and weeks previous, none of these tabletop digital games are really accessible to a lot of people um, out yeah. there. So... They are yeah, not it, well designed for accessibility. So the other one is Tabletopia. I've looked at Tabletopia. Tabletopia, to me, just looks like a watered-down version of Tabletop Simulator. But again, total caveat. I, I apologize in this case. We are not the ones to answer this question at this time. I don't know if I'm going to bother to go out and spend the money on Tabletop Simulator because it does cost money. Um, I don't know if there's any way I can get a review copy. It seems like something I should be able to get a review copy of, but I don't know how. <laughs> like who, who to even write to get a steam code for that um what i do know people use it for and deanna's mentioning this in the chat is both are known to be fantastic for, for prototyping because you don't need to make a physical game you can make it all there right. and i follow roger on social media and i've noticed roger's done that roger is a local game designer here in windsor and i've seen his physical games out at local events and i've seen him sharing pictures of what he's created i think it's in tabletopia and i gotta admit it looks impressive now, again, I think they're all just physics simulators in this case, but I could be wrong. 
it does look really cool uh and roger's mentioning he got it for 9.99 but i know that's a steal because right now i think normal canadian canadian price on steam for tabletop simulator is i believe 21.99 uh yeah. i'd have to i'd have to double check but i know it's up there um so so yeah it, it does go on sale fairly often yeah. like i said they both look cool i i don't know my recommendation i can't strongly recommend either without trying them myself there are a lot of free options though and i you know what give me a second I, I i'm not researching but i am going to at ten dollars, I would probably be buying uh, Tabletop Simulator. It is on my wish list, uh, so if it ever gets down to ten bucks again, I probably will pick it up just to have it. But uh, how much are the games though? How well, much again, are people the charging there for are their individual of, mod packs? There are a number of free uh, options as well in the Steam laboratory, whatever they call their right. uh, their their area. But uh, but yeah, a lot of the the of course the, the pricey games are pricey, uh, and again, they're between you know probably. And then, you know, four to five to ten dollars probably. Uh, yeah, so I know that's I've a seen lot a just to try for like nine bucks. Um, All right. So what I recommend are other sites. So we talked about Board Game Arena. There is also Yukata.de, uh, which I did play on a little bit the other day, and it's it's Board Game Arena. They're all kind of the same, right? It's a web based interface that does a pretty good job of recreating the look and feel of whatever board game you're playing. There is also Board Gaming Online, which is hyphenated, Board Gaming hyphen online. There is, if you like brass, there is a site, brass.orderofthehammer.com, where all you can do is play brass. It's extremely well done. Like someone did a really good job making the game look like the game. Um, there's Spielby Web, which is another one. Um, Board Game Geek actually has a wiki that lists all online games with about 200 of them. Uh, there's Board Game Arena, Tabletopia. Both La Joux, which is a French site, which I could never figure out even how to start a game, but I think you have to register, and I haven't done that yet. Uh, there's HappyMeeple.com, which hosts online gaming. Like, there are a number of options. The two, the biggest ones are Yukata and Board Game Arena for free. I don't know if Yukata has been having the problems that Board Game Arena has as far as um, load. I was able to get on and play something fine, and I don't have a paid account there. So it's, it seems like less people have heard of them. Yukata, yes. Yukata, Yukata. Yeah. .de. I was uh, able to get in and jump in a game right away. And I and I did just check uh, the premium membership on Board Game Arena is currently thirty four dollars and eighty cents a year, or two dollars and ninety cents a month. Yeah, so, see, that's pretty cheap, right? Like, yeah, it, it's I to, the, to not me, wait in line if, you, if you've got continuing. I play fourteen games at a time. I couldn't mm. say no to giving them money, and I'm I'm happy to give them money. So. So yeah, Ryan's noting for accessibility. I, I again, I wouldn't expect. Much. I, I wouldn't it's, hold my breath for any. What, of what do you call ones. it? Sprite based graphics. Like it's just, it's all the same system that Board Game Arena uses, yeah. right? Like it's all it's all very graphical. Click on things, to get things done. Yep. So I don't know. Like I, I'd have a goal. I don't know if it's going to happen. Mm -hmm. I have a goal to um, Sean and I to review some of these sites and literally recommend the best <laughs> of them. It's just finding the time to do it and possibly the money. Yeah. which is something I don't know if that's something we want to open up our budget to or not. We'll see if, if maybe we buy tabletop tabletop simulator and stream some stuff on it on Fridays or something. So then it's at least more worth it than one blog post topic. Yeah. Well, something again, and it's one of those things. Well, we'll, we'll both, uh, you know, if I see it on sale, I'll, I'll let us know and we'll, yeah. we'll figure it out at that point when it, see the other problem too, for us, now this is a personal problem. Well, not a personal problem, but, this is something that sucks about Steam is the Steam family account doesn't work with any of the board games. So if Deanna also wants to play with us, which is what we're going to want to do, like if I want to play online with Deanna, we both have to buy the game. So I got to buy two copies of Tabletop Simulator and I got to buy two copies of the mod pack so Deanna and I can play, which is terrible. Yeah. It's it just, it's it's a horrible, like I get why they do it because it'd be too easy to just give out codes to your friends or whatever if it wasn't, if there was some way to share accounts, but like they have a family account. But we have yet to find a single game the family account actually works on. Yeah, no, it's uh, it's an issue. So that's another limiting, right? I mean, so even, even even board game arena, you were forced to buy yes. have a premium account in order for both of you to play because they don't mm -hmm. want people uh, cheating within the same IP. Yeah, address. they don't want to have someone to have two windows open and play two different players. Which man, I can't believe people even do that. That they have to have a rule for it. Well, I mean, because they have tournaments and stuff, people are. I know. Yeah. I get whenever, it. Whenever there's competition, there's someone willing to cheat. 
<laughs> but yeah, I, I do want to. I do want to check it out. And maybe it'll be by next week. I don't know. Like I said, it's definitely a topic that's still hot. I get notifications on my phone every day of some other website yet again posting how do I play online, and some of the answers are terrible. Like, well, well they don't know. Like Board Game Maria is a fantastic. They don't know the free action, or maybe they're getting paid to promote the other sites. I don't know what it is. But I'm like, people are like, oh, you can play all these games on Steam. I'm like, everyone knows about Steam. Like, yeah. who knows about BoltLajou.com, right? Like, that's kind of why I was hoping for. Yep. Uh, so, uh... But yeah, Roger, I, I know you, instead of buying a pint of beer every Wednesday, you know, <laughs> once a month, you buy one less pint of beer. <laughs> I know you're not going out to easy mode anymore, but in, and you buy an account on Board Game Arena. That's what I would recommend in your case. Now, that one, you won't be able to put your games on. There is no user content on board game arena it is it is all done well, there is the a developer there is an api that can be worked with but i don't know how you access it so, yeah like it's it's not part of the basic service right yeah. it's not like it's yeah hey man what you've done so far looks fantastic the stuff i've been seeing on my facebook feed looks really good oh hey we should actually create a group on board game arena i didn't realize there were groups <laughs> Just, I didn't know we could do that. Neither did I. I'm just all of a sudden, I'm like, find a group. Oh, you can do groups? Maybe we should have a tabletop bellhop group. Yeah, uh, you know what? I'll drop links to all those on, like, I again, I don't reckon, necessarily recommend all of these because I haven't tried them, but I will drop all of the, the links. I dropped them in the chat here, but I'll drop them in the show notes for anyone that has to be listening to this later for a bunch of these online game places. Uh, and I just noticed that Board Game Marina actually has merchandise. I, I might consider buying a coffee mug because it's like go. 16 bucks canadian for a coffee mug that has the board game arena and i mean we pimp them all the time they aren't not sponsors i give them money every month they, they should be paying us they, they really should, should be paying us, us except right now time. they have gone from f an average of yeah, five thousand users to fifteen thousand users and up to tw actually no they're sorry they've hit twenty thousand users Active, since yeah. since this has happened um they are not hurting <laughs> no they don't need our help but yeah we've been we've been advocating from them since uh yeah. eric franklin pointed it out to me quite a while ago now at this point yeah. all right what do we got next so next up uh we have a question from rick wayne anyone know of a game similar to betrayal at house on the hill fantasy setting good for teenagers Okay, first off, Rick may be living under a rock or doesn't have a local game store, but there is a game called Betrayal at Baldur's Gate, which is a D&D &D re-theme of Betrayal at House on the Hill. So right there is the number one answer. There is literally a fantasy version of Betrayal at House <laughs> on the Hill. So that would be my number one recommendation. Um, I don't know if Rick hadn't heard of that yet, which is possible. Not everyone watches board game media the way we do. Um, the other recommendation that I had immediately upon hearing this were the D&D &D games. So Dungeons & Dragons put out a series of board games that started when 4th edition of Dungeons & Dragons was popular still, was still the, the going edition, and they now call them the, the, the Adventure Series, or the Dungeons & Dragons Adventure Series. The first was called Wrath of a Shardalon. Uh, there was also, uh, there's a Ravenloft one, I own it, Castle Ravenloft. There was Legend of Drizzt. There's Temple of Elemental Evil. Um, probably, I think there's one based on one of the newer ones. So since 5th edition came out, they interestingly kept putting these board games out, which are still derived from the 4th edition rules. So they still have, like, uh, like they, they have powers and stuff, very similar to 4th edition. This is a very much a board game, um, which very similar to Betrayal at House on the Hill, you randomly build the dungeon as you're playing. And you have some kind of goal. And it's scenario-based. No scenario, not campaign, which we talked about many times on the show. I'm not going to get into the differences here, but it's a scenario-based game where you start off on one tile and you're going to explore the map and try to get to whatever the end goal of the scenario is. It's a cooperative game, so you're all working together against the game. Unlike Betrayal House on the Hill, there's no betrayer, there's no hidden traitor that's going to go against you. Now, these games are really solid. Also, if you are into role-playing at all, this is a great source of dungeon tiles and cheap miniatures. They're all unpainted, but you get a slew of miniatures in here and some really cool looking dungeon tiles. So that is, if you don't have it or aren't interested in Betrayal of Alders Gate, check out the Dungeons & Dragons Adventure Series games, which there are, they said a slew of different ones. Um, I'm not even sure what the newest one is. That's something maybe Sean will Google it, because I try not to Google while we're doing AMAs. So. Uh, next up, uh, Mountain Papa, one of our new followers, says, after Gloomhaven, what is a cool two-player legacy game 
new player legacy game. I've heard Aeon 10 Legacy is pretty good. Uh, personally, my next one I would want to play is Clank Legacy. I don't know how great that is two player. I would Google that one. I would I would look that one up on Board Game Geek. Check the recommended players just to see if it's not might not be recommended with two players. Um, Pandemic plays extremely well with only two players, uh, especially if you each take on two roles instead of one. Uh, Pandemic Legacy is still it's what the number two game in the world, so it's the one step down from Gloomhaven. Though personally, I don't recommend playing that right now with what's currently doing in the world. I prefer my gaming to be a bit more escapism, and I don't need to be reminded of what's going on in reality while I'm playing. But maybe when this all blows over, you might be interested in looking into Pandemic Legacy. I've heard Charterstone is fantastic and plays good at low player counts. I haven't played that one myself. Um, trying to think of Risk Legacy, I would not recommend with only two players. I don't even know if you can. Uh, Lord of the Rings, Journeys in Miller Earth. Uh, Tori and Kat, who we play Gloomhaven with, have recommended that at two players. They say it plays really well. That's an app-driven game where the app's going to tell you the story. It's cooperative. There are a lot. There are a surprising number. Now, I don't know if you... If, if, I don't think I call Lord of the Rings Journey Middle-Earth a legacy game, though. Sorry, that's a campaign game where your characters evolve and you play through it. But there's no legacy elements. There's nothing you rip up. There's no... You can play through scenarios more than one time. Sorry, campaign-based game. Uh, like I, if you were looking at campaign based games, I would explain it, ex expand it to um, Star Wars Imperial Assault as well. With two players, I would recommend playing with the app and playing the co-op mode. But you could also play one player plays the Empire and one player plays the Rebels. Again, no legacy element, but there's a full campaign. You play through 10 games to get through a whole campaign. You slowly build your deck and improve your characters. A fantastic game. Uh, and uh, so Clank Legacy Acquisitions Incorporated uh, is listed as. Uh, well recommended at two players, so it's best yeah, at so four. So. Best at four, but but two and three players are both uh, well recommended. Um, All right. So Ryan pointed out that the games I mentioned, similar to Be Trailhouse in the Hill, do not have a hidden traitor. So if that's the aspect of Be Trailhouse in the Hill you like, not the exploration of the castle or or so the castle, the the house. If you like the traitor aspect and you want fantasy, I would recommend. Uh, Shadows over Camelot. That is a Arthurian. So there is a dragon in it. So it's fantasy. It's a it is Arthurian where you are playing Knights of the Round Table and you are trying to defend Camelot that's being beset by all kinds of things. So you you're trying to find the Holy Grail. Uh, Lancelot is trying to uh, sorry you're trying to find the Holy Grail. You're trying to find Excalibur. Lancelot is fighting um, the Black Knight and there's a joust going on and there is also a um, siege there's a siege going on so there's catapults attacking and then there's the normans and the picks attacking no the normans are arthur who is it that's the picks and the saxons maybe yeah i think it's the picks and the assassins and arthur are the normans i'm messing up my british history uh whatever you're being attacked by both sides and it's a card driven game where you have to try to like deal with all these things at once it's a really difficult uh co-op game at first when you first start playing it and then, well, the trick is that one of the players possibly is a traitor who's actually working against it and wins the game if Camelot falls, which is, you know, throws in the whole Lancelot goes insane kind of thing into it for the miss. But really solid. I, that used to be one of my favorite games to bring out the public play events because a lot of people in Windsor that come up to gaming events role play for once. So you get a lot of role playing in that game. It's almost required because you're not allowed to talk about like Gloomhaven. You're not allowed to talk about what you have in your hand. You have to, you know, role play it and talk, oh, I'll go really quick or I'm going to go fight the Normans and I'm going to need help at the end instead of saying, hey, I need a five card. Um, plus, the way the game works, because on every turn, the bad guys go, then you go, the bad guys go, then you go. You can drop out of the game and it doesn't affect the overall game and people can join in. So if you're playing with five players and then someone shows up new to the game night, it's like, hey, come here, take a character card. And then they're in for the next round, and it works. But the it's not a legacy game. No, definitely not. Like, no, <laughs> this is going back to the betrayal at the House on the Hill recommendation, yeah. not the legacy game recommendation. I would. The Styles Over Camelot is not a good two-player game. It doesn't work. Don't even try. I, it's got to be at least three-player minimum. But that's to, to throw in a fantasy game with a with a traitor element that a teenager would probably enjoy. I think they'd enjoy the role-playing aspects. They probably like beating up catapults. I don't know. I'm trying to think of me as a teenager, right? <laughs> they like dueling and and doing the joust. Like that would all be neat stuff at that age it would have been neat to me at that age saxons and picks yeah the normans are the king arthur is part of the norman empire or whatever all right well 
Well, we got in the chat room. Or are we gonna move on? I don't know. I think we're. I think we're gonna be moving on. It looks like uh, things have quieted down. So what do we have this week? This is a pretty good mix of topics, actually. So we basically oh, defined what a game is. Oh, that, yep. that'll be a useful one. We talked about what a game is. Talked a bit more about Monopoly games. We've got Escape uh, Sword of Betrayal. I'm just looking for, yeah. for the show post later. All, All right. right. So one of the things we're going to try to remember to do this regularly, we do try to do an Ask Us Anything, Ask Me Anything on the last Wednesday of the month. So our next one, assuming I don't forget, please remind me if it looks like I'm going to, and I start talking on Twitter about the wrong topic, on April 29th, we should be having another Ask Us Anything. Uh, this should have happened last week, and with everything going on, I literally just didn't even consider it until we showed up. And I think it was Ryan in the chat room was like, isn't it an AMA tonight? And I'm like, Oh, wow. Totally for but no, <laughs> but no, uh, at any time though, you can ask your questions. You don't have to be here live. I love it when you're here live. Cause then we can interact and you can go, Oh, I agree with this. I want this, etc." cetera. Uh, send your questions to questions at tabletop bellhop.com or hit me up on social media. All right. Well, uh, that, uh, that's it for our thoughts on our AMA this week. And again, always, you can head over to the blog at tabletopbellhop.com where you can find all sorts of gaming topics that we cover. And some of our AMA questions might even get turned into topics at some point. Yeah, some of these, if I can expand on them, I will do that in the future. We keep growing with the support of fans like you, so please take a minute to subscribe, follow, like, rate, review, click on the bell, thumbs up, retweet, or share with your friends. We're looking to grow the brand even more. Always something new in the works, so now's the time to get in on the ground floor. Sign up to receive Tabletop Bellhop Weekly in your inbox. Once a week, I send out an email recapping all the content we released in the week previous. Uh, new blog posts, new podcast episodes, new reviews, new Ask the Bellhop questions, new actual plays, or anything else we create. You can sign up at newsletter.tabletopbellhop.com. All right, just one final reminder that except for the podcast that we're recording right now, Wednesday nights at Twitch, 9 p.m. Eastern, all of our other Twitch streams, all of our other scheduled streams are on hold until further notice. Now, I do have a couple of unboxings to do, and we're talking about maybe streaming a uh, game online at some point, but I don't have a set date for when those are going to happen. Be sure to follow us on Twitch so you do get notified if we decide to do something unscheduled. And as well, on Twitter, we'll usually announce something there. Yeah. All right. <laughs> Up next, Mo has resurrected a classic review from 2013, looking at the board game Warriors. All right, with quarantines and everything else going on right now, I am sad to say I have not had a chance to get in any plays of my games on the pile of obligation. So I apologize, companies who gave me review copies, but I'm sure you understand with what's going on right now. I just can't fire through all those games like I was able to when we were having gaming events every weekend. So I needed something to review this week, so I thought it'd be a good chance to resurrect one of my classic game reviews. So before I did this whole bellhop thing, I used to run a website called the Windsor Gaming Resource. And on that site, I published a bunch of reviews of games I played. Now, these are reviews. This is long before any publishers knew who I was. This is all stuff I bought and I liked and I wanted to talk about. Now, previous re-reviews like this have done really well. So we've done Race for the Galaxy and Alhambra, and I actually get a lot of positive feedback on those. Actually, last show, we had someone write in and thanking me for the Race for the Galaxy review. So I thought, why not? Let's do another one of these. And on the blog, I'm going to release it tomorrow for, you know, Throwback Thursday. That's kind of an online thing. Just because it's old doesn't mean we won't review it. Yes. Sometimes the classics are where it's at, either great in and of themselves or as a place in history. Yeah, very true. So first off, I want to thank you Patreon patrons for helping me pick which classic review to resurrect this week. I gave them a choice of four different games, and they're the ones that picked Quarriers. So that's the one we're looking at today. Now, this Quarriers was designed by Mike Elliott and Eric M. Lang. Those are big names nowadays in board gaming that people may not have been a big back then. Those are some famous designers. It features art from Jay Lonnie and Chris Ramo. Uh, it was published by WizKids in 2011. Now, I am not going to go over the entire review here on the show. Uh, I basically reposted the original review word for word over on the blog. I was definitely a little more verbose back in 2013 than I am now. So if you do want to see the whole thing, 
just go over to the blog. And uh, so interestingly, it was released in 2011, but it was actually awarded a uh, a prize at Origins in 2013, the year you wrote this uh, uh, this review. There's a reason for that. So I didn't dive into this here in the review at all. So when Couriers, the original came out, it was in a tin, in a cube that looked like a die. So kind of good marketing, but everyone hated the tin. It was, you couldn't fit it on your game shells. It didn't store the components separately. You always had to split up the dice at the beginning of every game. There was no play mats. There were a lot of issues with the first printing of the game. So what I actually reviewed was the first deluxe box set that came out. So it's the second edition or second printing of Couriers. And that's the one that won all the awards. And don't so forget, that's the reason for that one. Don't forget that's Couriers with an exclamation mark. Yes, Couriers, I should say. All right, so Couriers is a dice-based bag-building game where players all start with the same set of basic dice. Players then draw a number of dice from their bag, roll them, and then use them to do things. One of the things you're going to roll are like a, man, uh, a drip of water, it looks like. It's a mana-like resource, like Think Magic the Gathering, called Quiddity that you use to summon your monster dice, which are other dice you roll with monsters on them. The basic monster in the game uses the symbol of a pawn from chess. These all go into a player's active area. So you use your Quiddity to activate your pawns, and now you have your pawns in your active area. Monsters that are still in a player's active area by your next turn are how you score points. So you summon that pawn, and if nothing kills your pawn, it's still there at the start of next turn, you're going to get one point. Other monsters, of course, are going to be worth more points. The goal is to hit a certain point threshold, and this is based on the number of players. And I don't remember the exact numbers, but say it's 10 points for two players and 15 for three or whatever. After scoring points, after you get your points for your monsters that are in play, you can then attack with the monsters that are there, uh, this is interesting because depending on the number of players, you always attack everyone. So if I attack with my pawn, I'm attacking everyone else with that one pawn, which is an interesting way to do it. Attacking combat is pretty much Magic the Gathering. You have an attack and a defense value. If my attack's higher than your defense, I defeat your die. Nice and simple. No, there's no attacking other players. So it's not Magic. It's not Star Realms. There's no way to attack the other player. The only thing you're doing is killing their monsters that are in play. So is there really a difference between attacking a player versus their monsters? Do players even have health? No, is there... like I said, there, there is no attacking players in this. Right. Not at all. You can't. All you're doing is trying to make sure that the person doesn't have monsters at the start of the turn, because if they do, they score points. Right. Now, after combat, you're going to look at any of your leftover quiddity. So whatever you didn't use to summon monsters, and you're going to use that to buy new dice from a central market. Uh, the market's made up of monsters and spells. On the blog, I get into details of how many of each, but it doesn't really matter. These are how you get new dice and new more powerful dice. And similar to most deck building games, the more quiddity you spend, generally the more powerful the creature you get. So really calling this a board game is a bit deceiving. It's really a card game with a bag building dice game. Yeah, pretty much. There is technically, if there's a player board to keep track of where your dice are. So like they have to go into an active area when they're active, and then they go into a used pile, which is on a little player board, and then the used pile sits there until you need to reshuffle your bag or pull, redo your bag. So then you grab everything in your used pile and throw it in. And there's actually some strategy there where you might want to put stuff into your active pile so it doesn't get cycled through your bag. So there's some board elements. Like there's 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 probably more than say Dominion. Overall, it's a pretty simple to teach game. Like I just gave you the really basic overview. View the only thing you need to know is what the different symbols on the dice mean to really be able to play based on what I just said. And what it does have is a ton of variety. The original game comes with over 130 dice. There are a ton of different cards. And what's impressive is there are multiple monster cards for each die. So there's like a weak green die, like the, the green die is a slime. And there'll be three different dice representing slime, each with different abilities. So you're going to randomize which slime's in play when you use slime. So it's just a huge amount of replayability. Like It is highly likely that you'll never play two games of Quarters identical. Now, back when I first reviewed this game, looking at what I thought back in 2013, I was blown away by the, the mechanics of this game, the whole theory of... I, instead of being a deck builder where I'm building my deck, I'm building this bag full of dice and I'm pulling out dice and I'm I'm rolling my dice and some of them are monsters. That just blew me away. I thought it was completely unique and completely innovative. Like to me, it felt like uh, an evolution of deck building and an evolution is in a step up in a good way. Though there was one drawback is holy randomness, Batman. Like, you already have randomness in deck builders, right? So what's in the central market, of course, is randomized every game. So that's going to affect the game. 
what you draw in this, what you pull from your bag is going to matter, right? So you've got those two elements, but then what you pulled are dice and every die has six sides, right? Like that's just a the crazy number of variables to keep track of. You're, you're, you're just, everything's random. And one quote that I like, that this is my one complaint and I like the way I worded this that from the original review. So I'm going to quote here. So even though you may have saved up and bought that awesome dragon, he's not going to help you much at all if all you do is keep rolling one quiddity on that dragon die every time. And that is the, the fall down of Quarriers, I find. Overall, though, I, it was a positive review. It was, it, I found the randomness tolerable, and I enjoyed the game and pretty much gave it a thumbs up by the end. Well, there are a lot of folks out there who disapprove of games that not only feature randomness, but square it by layering randomness yes. on top of randomness. And that's just it, right? Like, it's just, it's randomness on top of randomness on top of randomness. So what about now? What are your thoughts on Quarriers today? All right, so most of what I had to say in the review still stands. I, I still think it's a really neat mechanic. It's 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 well done. It's, it's cool. Um, I went on to play Quarriers many times after this review. Um, I even went on to feature it at some local events. I hosted a Quarrier night at Brimstone Games. I even included it in a great Canadian board game list. So I thought this game was worthy, was tournament worthy. Like I thought that, that you get ranked points, four players can sit down and one player can play better than others. So to me, if I throw it in a blitz, it means that I think it's a solid game. Multiple expansions were released all with a Q name. Each added some little extra something. Some had giant dice, others had more monsters. There were new spells and so on. And I picked up most, not all of them. So I noticed you use the past tense in all your you're talking about it playing. Yeah, because yeah, definitely because something happened that had me stop playing Quarriers completely, and I honestly have not touched the game since. Late in 2014, WizKids, the company that produced Quarriers, released a brand new dice-based dueling game called Marvel Dice Masters: Avengers vs. X Men. Now, I admit, I didn't actually try it when it came out. I didn't get into it till 2015, and that's because it kept selling out everywhere. This was literally the Keyforge problem back in 2014. You could not find decks, well, decks, dice, whatever you want to call it. You couldn't find starter packs for Dice Masters anywhere. Now, this new dice game is an evolution of Quarriers. It took the basic mechanics of Quarriers and refined and fine-tuned every little bit of them. They also changed the game to a collectible format starter sets and random booster packs now that part i'll admit i didn't really appreciate though i did because oh my god my first booster is sitting in a coffee shop opening them i just had that joy of going back to opening up magic packs so i i hate well i hate it and i loved it all at once now dice masters moved the game further away from its deck building roots like further from games like dominion uh and closer to more dueling games like magic the gathering they completely removed the wilderness there's no central market anymore Instead, players do pre-game deck building or dice building or both, right? Because the de the decks just tell you what the dice represent. So you would get your card your, for Spider-Man, you would pick your Spider-Man card and then decide to buy one, two, three, or four Spider-Man dice to have in your game. Um, so you're, it's all pre-constructed, right? So now players sit down to play. Each player would have their own set of cards and their own set of dice. The goal was completely changed. So the goal went back to what we talked about earlier. Now you are attacking the other player. So yes, you can defend with your heroes in front of you, but the goal is to knock the other opponent's hit points down to zero. And you're using heroes and villains to do it. Well, it's a familiar mechanic most of us just don't even think yeah. twice about now. It's just how, how else are we going to do things like that? That's how you play like games. Cool. You, you attack each other, right? And you defend with your summoned stuff in front of you. Yeah, just overall, Dice Masters to me was a better game. Uh, it was quicker. Uh, they had more dice that mitigated the randomness. They had some really neat generic powers that were based on the the, the j basic dice you start with. Um, I like the Marvel setting better. Like, I'm into fantasy, but, like, Quarriers was completely generic fantasy, whereas being able to fight, you know, Spider-Man versus Doc Ock, I'm into that. I dig that. And I like the force-building aspects. I like the fact that I went out and bought booster packs and I could make a, a themed deck. I could team up Wolverine with Spider-Man and throw in Kitty Pride because she has an E-Force field effect. The combos with, you know, the, that's the whole thing, right? Uh, due to that, I never played Quarriers again. I literally did not keep it. Um, I, I like didn't never played it. I kept it for a while uh, to bring out the public play events, but to be honest, it's gone. I sold it to someone at some point. I don't remember when. Maybe I put it in an extra life auction. I'm not sure where it went, but I no longer have it. Now, I will say there are a couple advantages Quarriers does have over Dice Masters. So there are reasons people might want to seek this game out. One is it plays four players. Dice Masters is a two-player duel. 
yes, there are some variant rules for playing multiple players, but just like trying to play multiple players in Magic or Sorcerer, they're not optimal. You want to play two players. The other thing too, though, is Quarriers is ready to go. It is a pick up and play game. I can show up to a gaming event. Sean can come down from, from Hamilton. I can throw out Quarriers and we can just, here you go. Here's the stuff. We put out the market. Let's play. There's no deck building, right? There's no, we don't each have to have our own set of the game. There's none of that. You just sit down and play. Whereas if we want to play deck masters, either I have to build Sean a deck or he's got to come down and I got to show him all his cards and he's got to build his own deck. And we can't just sit down and just play where you can do that with Quarriers easily. Yeah, it's a definite definite advantage for uh, drop of the hat plays, uh, unless you're you know in a league sort of setting with uh, you know magic type players who yeah. have their dice masters set all ready to go. Uh, yeah. It's not as it's not as uh, you know casual. True, and there is of course organized play for this. So at this point, I can't recommend Quarriers. Like, but you know what? If it sounds cool, if what I just described sounds neat to you, like this whole bag building dice rolling mechanic sounds interesting, I do suggest checking out Dice Masters. Now, at this point, there are a ton of different sets out there. Uh, it's not just Marvel. Uh, there's DC, there's Warhammer 40K, there's Teenage Mutant Ninja, Ninja Turtles, and one of their latest sets is WWE. So you can even do wrestlers with Dice Masters. And what's cool that they've done to many of us who are not a fan of the collectible element is they have released a lot of these licensed variants in standalone what they call campaign boxes. So you can pick up a TMNT campaign box. You can pick up a WWE campaign box that removes the collectible element. And then you have everything ready to play right in the box with some pre-constructed decks or pre-constructed, whatever you want to call them, forces on each side. Well, for a more in-depth look and a reposting of Mo's full 2013 Quarriers review, head over to tabletopbellhop.com and click on Reviews. And now, the Bellhop's Tabletop, where we look back and summarize what's happened since we were last here. What games hit our tables? Every week, we like to take a look back at the games we played, any events we attended, and any other cool gaming stuff that happens to be going on. Now, this past week was even slower than the previous week uh, in regards to tabletop gaming for me. Uh, the local school board finally put out some homeschooling curriculum, so my girls have been rather busy with that, especially trying to keep up on some. Uh, plus, Bobby got them some new dry clay, and they've been trying to uh, play with that. And they are obsessed with scribble knots on the Wii U right now, the DC superhero scribble knots. So they've been keeping themselves busy. They haven't wanted to game with that lately. So that's fine. Now, Deanna's still under the weather. So there hasn't been any physical gaming at all for me, actually, at this point. Now, I do continue to play some games on Board Game Arena, uh, including my best ever showing in Terra Mystica, playing the Giants. Uh, they are the red race in that game. And they, so far, may be my favorite race ever. all. Uh, my favorite race overall now sean what about you any actual in-person gaming this week or just more digital as usual well i actually did manage to get the kids to sit down and we did a, a brief battle of hogwarts battle harry potter hogwarts okay. battle which we finally got our chance to open box two of the monster box of monsters cool. uh so now as as is often the case this not only adds new cards but some new components as well to the uh harry potter now, unfortunately, it went very poorly for us, and we ended it early when it was clear at that point there was just no recovering. Uh, the kids, you know, the kids weren't enjoying it. You could see that this was, you know, one of those, oh, God, please don't let us keep going on this game. Wow. And so we ended it. Uh, a poor opening villain draw uh, had us on our heels right from that very first card. So we were pulling, you know, from, from, game, from step one, we were drawing uh, up to three dark arts cards to start the Jeez. game so it was it was unfortunate we lost two two of the three locations before we defeated a single villain i they just seem to have messed the balance up on that game overall like for something i think is generally targeted at least not necessarily kids but younger people it yeah. seems really weird to, to make it that hard and frustrating to me i again and this is a house ruling thing you know it, it's options and i haven't generally try uh, gone that way but i really think that the opening draw and the composition of the villain deck makes all the difference in the world so what uh in the monster box of monsters you're adding the monsters from whatever box you've opened in mm -hmm. uh the voldemort uh he who shall not be named is always the same at the bottom of the deck he's always the last right. uh and then you shuffle in randomly uh six other monsters or creatures wow. from 
the rest of it. So you've got 10 villains to fight. Uh, and it, you, you could just end up with the really nasty ones. Um, and, and unfortunately for us, we did. We ended up with sort of an almost worst case scenario mm. of the first three. So I think if you were to preset, at least the, even if you just preset the initial three villains so that you had a chance to start building an engine, right? then it might mitigate a lot of the, the sort of agony of, of, the, of what happened. I don't know. It's just multiple times you had to quit part way through because you're like, there's no way we can finish this. Like yeah. any game, you have to quit part way through. There's just something a little wrong there. It yeah. almost sounds like it needs like an ABC deck, like one of those where you take the really difficult bad guys, you shuffle three of them, take one out. That's the bottom. Then yeah. you take the B and you take three of those and you shuffle them and take one out. And then you take the A. Like I, the multiple games, Stephen yeah. Feld's famous for having that mechanic where that way it ramps up intentionally yeah. well then that's the thing i think if i if i were to house rule and just say all right these are going to be our first three villains and randomize the rest of it yeah we'd probably have that better chance because again you get that opportunity to get the engine building right you don't you're not just behind the eight ball from the first car you know the first literally the very first thing that happens in that game or happened in that game for us was we drew three dark arts events cards all everyone lost like four health and we added symbols on the location so we started losing yeah. the location before anyone had a chance to play yeah, i gotta That's... break this one out with my kids again well at least with big g i don't know little g's probably ready for that one now yeah, so no, I'd, I'd, I'd rather see. play with all four of us though so it's... that again maybe yeah again well, i mean we, we're playing it three player uh uh generally um but uh, there's definitely yeah there's definitely some advantages of playing four player because again it's asymmetric player powers so the more powers you have the more you can yeah, you can sort of you know plan yeah, to sort of work with yeah. each other, and you know, um, I, I try not to quarterback, but uh, the kids are getting better, and they, you know, what I do a lot of times is the kids have cards that they like better, so I'll try and shape my deck around knowing that Fair. well they like that card, so they're going to go that way, and I'll I'll lean off on this way. Yeah, I think we're only on book like three or something like that. It's one we have not gotten out in a long time. Yeah, and well, re and realistic. So you're you're sort of at the cusp because I believe. Yeah. I believe it's either uh, book or five or book four that they say, if you are an experienced player, open these three boxes and start. Yeah. Um, uh, that's right in the rule book is at this you know, point, I'd be tempted to start back with book one just cause I have no, <laughs> yeah, you know so what? It's not a bad. And especially if you, if you are going to have little G in as well, yeah. it's, it's a nice way to ramp a uh, ramp up for her. All right. Uh, well look ahead. What do you have planned for the coming week? Uh, I don't know. I got a couple unboxing videos I want to do, but not a lot on the schedule right now. I don't even know if I'm going to do those in the coming week or the week after. We've got like five saved up to do. I kind of want to get Eclipse open, but I'm just like, I'm going to unbox it, want to play, and until the end is feeling better, no, I'm not going to teach Big G how to play Eclipse, right? Like, she's not at that level yet. We're not going to dive into that. Um, Little D has a video she wants to record. I just haven't figured out, a logistically, I haven't figured out where to do it and how to do it. Like, I'm almost wondering if maybe her sitting on my lap and doing it here might work better than downstairs. So we haven't figured that out yet. Plus, like I said, they now have homework now, and that's been a little bit more interesting. But, yeah, I want to do it at some point. Uh, mainly, I just hope Indiana gets better for multiple reasons. But gaming-wise, selfish gaming-wise, it'd be nice to be getting back to the pile of obligation and getting some non-kids games played, too. Yep, absolutely. Now, a quick shout-out and a thank you to some of our VIP guests. Our Patreon backers, we greatly appreciate their support. Kator, we miss you both. We miss playing Gloomhaven. Friday nights just aren't the same. Duran Barnett, thank you. Timothy Smith, thanks, Timothy. Jeff Seuss, thanks, Jeff. Uh, welcome back, P.S. Goujon. Sad to see you go, but glad to see you back. Well, that was the double bell. All right, that means my shift is coming to an end, and we're going to have to lock those front doors. Though the doors for the lobby are closed, you can always find us across the web and social media as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. Drop by our website at tabletopbellhop.com for more gaming content. If you like the content we're providing and would like to support our continued efforts, please consider tipping your bellhop through our new and improved Patreon at patreon.com slash tabletopbellhop. Remember to join us here on Twitch every Wednesday night at 9 p.m. Eastern and watch for the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast to hit your podcatchers in YouTube at 2 a.m. every Tuesday. Well, that about wraps up the time we have for the show tonight. For those of you here live, 
thank you for joining us. And if you stick around, join us in the Pento Suite for the after show. For Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, I'm Sean. And I'm Mo. Thank you. And game, game on. on.